Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that the very things that we are singing about in Psalm 81 are the things that we are doing this evening as we come to study your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us. We thank you that you have created and are recreating us in the image of your beloved son, Jesus. And we pray that through the Spirit, you would indeed give us eyes to ear, uh, hear, uh, or eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. We thank you uh, for uh, the promise with the opening of your mouth and the hearing and the obeying uh, that you would fill us uh, with good things and that you would satisfy us even with things that are impossible for us to do in our own strength, such as the provision of water or um, honey from rocks. And indeed, we ask and, and thank you um, that the, the very rock that Moses struck being Christ, uh, we pray that from Christ and now through his, uh, now that you sit at the right hand of God the Father, that you, Jesus, would, would bless us with the good things of the Spirit, your word, and that we would be taught to walk in your paths and that we would be used to call others to call upon your name and to obey you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this evening, what I'd like to do as we uh, uh, continue our study of the book of Isaiah is uh, some more uh, application of the sermon from this past Lord's Day uh, where we have been looking at the the depravity, the fall of Israel, God's son in the Old Covenant. Um, but in Isaiah, that's uh, followed by uh, great promises of hope and salvation. And we began to look at Isaiah chapter 2 and the, the promise of salvation in the last days, the days in which we uh, now live, where Isaiah says in chapter 2, beginning in a similar way as chapter 1, the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, that will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it and many peoples will come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations, and will render decisions for many peoples, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. So are there any comments or questions uh, about this sermon? I'll be uh, applying this more to church attendance uh, tonight going up to the house of the Lord and the new covenant. This is one of the ways in which the new covenant is better. We don't go to the earthly Jerusalem. We go to the, the heavenly Jerusalem, the, the very Mount Zion itself where our prophet and our priest and our king uh, now is. So the kings in Isaiah's day, uh, they ruled from earthly Jerusalem awaiting the kingship, the birth of David's greater son, Jesus. Now we live in the age in which David's greater son, Jesus, has overcome. He was lifted up, and he is drawing all men to himself. And worship in the new covenant, and we'll be looking again at this, it is a worship in heaven itself. And uh, church, so going to church is going to heaven. That's how we are to think about the Lord's Day. That's how the writers, uh, that's how Isaiah saw and foresaw the greatness of the new covenant. Uh, the last days in which we now live. That's how the John saw it in the book of Revelation. That's how the writer of the Hebrews saw it. But are there any comments or questions about that? All right, well, let's start um, with uh, a state of the church. This comes from Barna, and uh, Barna is noted from 1993 to 2020. Uh, a, a sharp decrease in, uh, and this is for uh, the United States, in church attendance. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see here, um, basically, you had a little bit less than half of uh, U.S. adults attending church weekly um, back in 1993. And today, it's boarding around uh, 29 to 30%. <clears throat> and they said, uh, it looks like the trend is not going away. Uh, in fact, the trend um, is accelerating. Um, another uh, graph from uh, Barna <clears throat> also uh, looks at weekly church attendance um, based on um, age groups. And so you can see uh, like Gen Z and millennial and uh, boomer and elder 
Um, and uh, basically, the older group, the elders, those who uh, were born before 1946, um, they are currently making up 37% of church attendance in the United States in 2020. Uh, they made up over 50% uh, back in 19, or 2003. Uh, you can see then that after the elders, you have under them, uh, I think it's the, the boomers in yellow. Let me see if I can get, help you see this a little bit more clearly. So the, the boomers would be the yellow line here. So they were about 45%, and then uh, nowadays it's down to 37%. And then as you get to um, the, the Gen X and the millennials, you can see that that's decreasing. And again, this is accelerating. And as the older generation uh, goes to be with the Lord, the weekly attendance is going to continue to drop even more. So that's uh, kind of where we're at um, as we think about what Isaiah foresaw in the last days. And uh, you can also see that this is true uh, by, by gender. And uh, Barna points out that the data indicate that women are no more likely to be actively churched in 2020 than men. So there used to be a disparity. Uh, in the South Sudan, there is a great disparity. But in the United States, it's uh, pretty much equal. So it's not, I think, before women... And you can see here um, that uh, women were attending more uh, frequently than men, uh, but that that's pretty much evened out, um, and, uh, and that's where we're at. All right, so that's a little bit where we're at in uh, church attendance, or as we'll be looking at heaven going, but are there any comments or questions about uh, where things are heading in our nation? All right. So the next question uh, would be for you. What are some reasons Christians are attending church less often or not at all? In fact, I, I Googled this, and they always have the, the, the wrong answer. There's some things that the Internet's not very helpful for. You know, if you're to Google this, and that's exactly what I did, uh, why should I go to church or reasons people don't go to church, uh, they give you all the wrong answers. So, um, But what, what would you uh, say are some reasons professing Christians um, are attending church less or not at all. Kaylee? Okay. So some Christians are super spiritual. They, they know more than those who go to churches with doctrinal views or denominations. So uh, they, they don't need church. Good. Uh, John? Uh, yeah, that's uh, another thing. A lot of Christians are staying home. Um, and I, I don't think when COVID goes away, this is going to go away, but maybe, hopefully I'll be proved wrong, but uh, a lot of people are re relying on just a, uh, attending church uh, at home through live streaming and uh, through technology. Good. Any other reasons people are not uh, professing Christians? I'm sure you know, must know some. So they don't want a formal church? Stiff, judgmental, hurtful. I've been hurt. They just want to be with Jesus. Okay? All right? Um, yeah, there's a common one. People have been hurt by church, and therefore they're not going to go anymore. Um, Isaiah was hurt by the church too. Um, Dad? That's right. We have less need for God. Um, we have everything that we, uh, at least that's what people say. Um, so we, we have less need for God. Yeah. Uh, John. Uh, yeah, it's employers um, are not really open to people taking the Lord's Day off or Christians don't really care. 
Uh, maybe that's a way out for them saying, oh, I get it to get out of church because now I have a good excuse and, and I might even make a little bit more money if I work on Sundays. Good. Any other uh, reasons uh, Christians are attending church less? Yeah, they don't understand the importance, bad theology. Um, I really couldn't find too many good reasons, biblical reasons that were given when I Googled it. Not that I rely on Google as my final answer, but uh, there's a lot of bad theology out there yeah, about why we go to church. Any other? These are pretty good. Um, I, I think uh, a few others, just to put the list here, also for those who are joining us online and are able, unable to uh, be with us physically. Um, and these are, again, things I found other people saying, you know, I don't need to go to church. My church is nature. I stand with, I meet with God when I walk on the beach, fish, or sit in my tree stand. Um, there's, uh, I think, as Kaylee mentioned, a lot of bad theology about the church. A lot of pastors and teachers give the wrong answers why you go to church. Christians have been taught to think like consumers. What does the church have to offer me? Often there is little or no visible direct benefit. And, uh, of course, we've been taught to walk by sight and not by faith. So we, a lot of Christians go to church like they go to Burger King and they want it their way. And so the church has actually been doing just that and giving it people's way. Um, but that's not what church is. It's, it's, it's not what do I get out of this. It's giving God what is due to him. Um, and, of, of course, sometimes um, if, if it, from a consumer uh, mentality, why would I go to church if I have to give other things like a tithe? Um, uh, another reason, churches have focused for many years on things like entertainment. And to be honest, there's better entertainment options else, elsewhere, um, including online. Uh, so we have, and I, I think uh, Kaylee mentioned this, more of a self-directed spirituality. You know, I, I can do this on my own. That's part of just the individualism of uh, the United States. Um, employers, as uh, I think John mentioned, are making it more difficult um, or more easy for Christians to have an excuse uh, why they don't go to church. Um, and, uh, of course, even if you were a Christian and told your employer, I can't work on the Lord's Day, your employer is going to know, you know, 20 counterexamples of Christians who have no problem doing that. So you're, you're already in the minority, uh, not just as a Christian, but as a Christian who wants to set aside the, the, the Lord's Day. Um, there's peer pressure. Uh, years ago, it was easier to attend church when everyone else was doing it. Now it's quite the opposite. You'll miss out on other opportunities, um, you know, like kids' activities. You know, there a lot of kids' activities. You know, it's um, you really have to make a decision: Am I going to go to heaven with my child, or am I going to go and do something else? That's that's really what's before you. It's not going to church or this kids' activity. It's am I going to go to heaven um, and uh, with my child? And a lot of the bad doctrine. A lot of modern Christianity and evangelism has tended to make a sharp dichotomy between getting saved and going to heaven when you die and going to church weekly. When in fact, going to church is going to heaven. That's what the scriptures teach. That's one of the glories of the new covenant. That's one of the glories of the temple that, that Jesus is building. Going to church is assembling, and we've been talking about Jerusalem in the Old Covenant, but in the New Covenant, it's the New Jerusalem, and that's where we are going in the New Covenant. So the New Covenant is superior because in the Old Jerusalem, there is no temple anymore. So even if Jews ethnically could uh, worship, they can't. The temple is, the earthly temple is gone, uh, and that's a sign. It's a sign of the, the New Covenant and that the heavenly temple is in heaven itself. So this is where we are going, and this is what the uh, Isaiah foresaw about the, the last days, in which the, the nations, the ends of the earth, would be going to Jerusalem. So many Isaiah saw um, will say, Come, let us go up to the mountain uh, of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. And, and we noted that this is what the writer to the Hebrews, who has much to say about um, persevering, uh, there yet remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of God in Hebrews chapter 4. 
Um, uh, he reminds us in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, not forsaking the assembly of others. He begins in chapter 1 that we live in the, the, the last days now that the Son has sat down at the right hand of God the Father, having made purification for sins. This is the age in which we live. And, and he says in chapter 12, but you have come to Mount Zion. So this is, this is where we come on the Lord's day. So remember, in the, in when uh, Hebrews was written, my understanding is that you had Jewish Christians uh, who were thinking about going back to the earthly Jerusalem and the temple because my understanding is it was still standing. What the writer to the Hebrews is saying, you know, we live by faith. That's the whole chapter of faith, Hebrews 11. Uh, we walk by faith and not by sight. And it's by faith that we come and we understand that we come in the new covenant to Mount Zion. We come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So the, as we think about church attendance, church attendance <laughs> It's not really about attending something like you attend school or anything like that. You, you attend a lot of things in life. Uh, it's, it, it's going to heaven. That is what is, is happening when the church worships in spirit and truth and assembles on the Lord's Day to worship the triune God. So this is how we need to think about waking up on the Lord's Day morning. I am going to heaven. There's a now and a not yet. It's, it's by faith that we see these things. This is the whole pilgrimage of our life. And every Lord's Day, as, a, a, as it were, uh, on our pilgrimage, ulti ultimately, as we await the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem to come down out of heaven from God, uh, we are in the very presence of God, even in this evil age in which we live in. This is, this is the greatness of the, the, the divine power and the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the greatness of Jesus and the temple that he is building. And it's the greatness of, of where we are uh, when we worship the Lord. Any comments or questions about this idea of, or the biblical teaching here that going to church is going to heaven? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you've heard this before. Yeah. Hopefully, this is nothing new. I've been doing this for over 25 years, but. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a new way that I'm, I'm seeing it because we're looking at it from the, the perspective of Isaiah and sometimes you think, why would we study the Old Testament? And well, this is one of the reasons is that helps us to more clearly understand the, the age, the new covenant in Christ's blood in which we live. Mm -hmm. but, but you don't hear this very often. Yeah. I, I, it, you should hear it every week. But Any other comments or questions? Heidi? Mm -hmm. it makes you really thankful that yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Right. There's no more worship. Mm -hmm. One day ethnic Israel, I think, will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and will come to a realization of this. But in this age, ethnic Israel should see that the, one of the great signs of Messiah is the ingathering of the nations. And, um, but you're right. They do not have a temple to go to. They don't have. A, they have an earthly Jerusalem, but there's nothing there except a mosque. Yeah, that's that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other comments or questions? All right. So with that in mind, so here again are some objections. Right? How would you respond to the statement? Because th this is very common, and you know, you you know people who are like this, and maybe you give excuses why you're not going to heaven on a particular week. Um, so how would you respond to uh, the statement, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car? So this is, a, this is just the wisdom of the age, right? Oh, this is so clever. I mean, who came? This, is, this must be a Solomonic person who's, who's giving us such wisdom. But how would, how would you answer this kind of objection uh, to the importance of going to church? 
Uh, John. Um, yes, so we, we are told we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves in um, Hebrews chapter 10. Good. Any other ways you might answer this? You're not trying to become a car. <laughs> uh, you're trying to become more Christ-like. All right, very good. Any other uh, answers? So here's a, a couple other um, things to think about. It's true that going to church doesn't make you a Christian, but Christians don't have to wait until they die to go to heaven. I think that's what most people are thinking. I just have to wait till I die. What Christian doesn't want to go to heaven? The Bible teaches that uh, where we are on the Lord's Day is one of the excellencies of the new covenant. So it's, it's again, it doesn't make you a Christian, but aren't Christians going to heaven? Yes. And if Christians are going to heaven, why aren't you going to heaven? That's, that's the, the, the big question. And I, I think a lot of people will say, the reason I don't go to church or to heaven, and that's really how Christians need to think, because people think they have something better to do. And the only reason they're going to go to heaven after they die is because they have nowhere else better to go. But as long as you give a Christian somewhere more interesting and exciting to go while they're alive in this evil age, they'll take it. They'll be tempted by it. They'll consider it. They'll weigh it. Well, let's see what the options are. But after you die, you have no other options. So that, and I think a lot of Christians are, are thinking that way. It's a completely unbiblical way of thinking. How would you respond to this statement? Uh, and again, I'm taking these right from um, the Internet, um, from an article, How to Get into Heaven Without Being a Church-Going Christian. I've never understood the idea that the only way you can worship the infinite is to lock yourself into a finite box once a week. Yeah. All right, here's our finite box. So how do you answer uh, that objection? These are real, like, objections. Okay, right? So that's looking at the church as being a, a building instead of the, the people who are assembled and gathered. It's not a building. You really could have church outside, you know, and meet and assemble. Good. Any other? John? That's right. So we've been uh, seated with Christ in <clears throat> the heavenly places. Any others? <coughs> Anything? Um, here, another couple other things as we think about Isaiah and uh, then uh, Hebrews and the New Covenant. Um, God the Holy Spirit is infinite and eternal. He enables us to go to heaven when we assemble on the Lord's Day. So worship in spirit and truth as Jesus taught the Samaritan woman. So Isaiah 2 Isaiah foresaw that in the last days, many people will say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And Hebrews 12 says, you have come to Mount Zion. So we're not in a little box. We have come to Mount Zion itself. It's, it's the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, it's one of the glories of the new covenant. How would you respond to the statement? A Christian is someone who believes in Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and thus is assured of heaven. Therefore, I don't really need to go to church. You know, it's, I have Jesus as my Savior kind of thing. It's the body and the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm, whom he died for. Mm -hmm. Good. Anything else? Uh, yeah, you're missing out on a lot of the benefits of, of being a, a Christian, uh, the benefits of the means of grace and growth and grace, absolutely. Any uh, other answers that you might give to this kind of objection? I'd also add that the assurance of heaven isn't just future. 
going to heaven every Lord's Day is a great assurance. So that ties in with uh, what Rebecca was saying. There, sh there should be a great assurance uh, when you hear the Lord's pardon for sin and, and this is my body, this is my blood for you. That's a tremendous assurance. And you can't get that assurance anywhere else, the Lord's Supper. And what would you be assured of going, or why would you be assured of going to heaven after you die if you don't want to go to heaven when you're alive? And that's, that's the question that people really need to, to face. Um, so people always talk about this assurance and this love for Jesus, and I can't wait to get to heaven, uh, but just I, I have other things to do now. Um, let's see. How would you respond to the statement, for a long time the church has turned their noses up at Christians who don't attend church? And that's not what I'm doing. I'm encouraging them to, to serve the Lord, but you can judge me if you want anyway. I will be judged by another, but <clears throat> how would you respond to this? All right, so our noses are turned up for you because we're looking up to the, the Lord. All right, any other answers? I would say that Christians who choose not to attend church are turning their noses up at heaven. That's, that's how I look at it. As uh, John quoted from Hebrews 10 earlier, not forsaking our own assembling together. So that, that's, I, that's how I, I really see it. You're, you're turning your nose up to the finished work of Jesus and saying, you know, I'll wait for that heaven bet, but I, I'll do other things. This bride of Christ thing isn't all for me right now. That, that's... Um, that's how I view those, uh, if you're not going to church. How would you respond to the following? The main reason I gather with the church is because I am the church. The sec so here's a, a bad reason. So here's a reason why you should go to church. You are the church. The second compelling reason to attend a Sunday morning gathering is that you're bringing a friend with you or because you yourself are exploring Christianity. Um, true, we are just one stone, a living stone, being built together. Um, Ephesians 2, good. Any others? Right, yeah. I am the church. Right, right. You, like, uh, so you're the head of the church. Uh huh. You're a part of the body of the church. Like, uh, you know, as mentioned, the living stone, but you're not the head. Mm -hmm. uh, any other ways you might think about that? What, what is the definition of church, by the way? Do you know? It's the, the Greek word ekklesia. And so this, this misses the, the meaning of what church is. It's the assembly. It's the congregation. That's what the church is. So you can't say, I am the church. I am the assembly. I am the congregation. That, that, no, no, no. It's the, the gathering out of the elect from the four corners of the earth to worship in spirit and truth. Um, and all of life is a pilgrimage. And we arrive every Lord's Day in anticipation of the day when we will finally enter into God's rest. So it, it, it is, it's a, it's a foretaste of what will come. It's one of those things we talked about, the great assurance of going to church. Uh, you, you, the very fact that you're in the church on the Lord's Day, um, it, you don't see a better picture on earth of those who will be in the eternal city than what you see every Lord's Day. So what you see every Lord's Day, now I'm not talking to those who are providentially hindered or cannot make it. That's, that's the proper use of technology. So I'm not, I'm not addressing those. Uh, whose, whose hearts are in the, the highways to Zion, even though they, they're not able to travel um, and congregate with God's people. So I'm not, I'm not addressing that. I'm addressing those who are making these kinds of statements that I, I don't need uh, the church. Um, God, will be, God will not be waiting at the pearly gates with a clipboard putting check marks next to names that have 
exceptional church attendance. Yeah, that's right. I, I preach that every week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you respond to this? Does it sound right? Yeah, it's this idea of a works righteousness. Um, I'm not. I'm talking about going to heaven where your love is. You know, a loving God isn't a works righteousness. It's the work of, of the Holy Spirit. Um, how do people usually think of the pearly gates? Um, yeah, that's right. Peter is usually at the uh, the pearly gates. Mm -hmm. Not sure where that comes from. Does anyone know the history of that? <laughs> that's I, have, I don't even know where that came from. But you're right. Peter's usually there. <laughs> <laughs> but not not on the Lord's day. It's God that's there, right? But He is one of the twelve gates, right? So the um, John does see that uh, on the Lord's day. Mm -hmm. Right. God invites you each and every week, and you're you're like I have something more important to do. Jesus actually told parables about that, you know, the, the wedding supper that was being thrown for uh, the king's son, and everyone has their excuse that they have more important things going on. Um, and the, uh, again, gathering for worship on the Lord's Day, we might also answer to worship in spirit and truth. So not every form of worship is acceptable to God. Um, it is coming to the gates of heaven. You are coming to the gates of heaven. Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together. That's the old covenant. The new covenant, that's the very place in which we are uh, coming to. And that's how we then sing Psalm 122 in the new covenant. Think of the Apostle John on the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1. The whole book of Revelation is largely about worship, and it ends with the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God as a bride beautifully prepared for her, her husband. John, who is in exile, so he couldn't attend church, right? He's in exile for his testimony to the Lord Jesus. So he's on the island of Patmos all by himself. And, and he says in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet, saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So we could, we could continue to follow this out, but John sees what, where the church is at on the Lord's Day. So that John can't be with the church at that point when he's exiled, but God, but God, through the work, God the Holy Spirit takes him, and he sees by vision uh, the reality. What we see by faith, John sees by the sight of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the beauties of the book of, of Revelation. It's a book of worship. And what he sees in Revelation chapter 5, he sees that on the Lord's Day, the, the assembly of all of creation and all of heaven and earth and giving the triune God his worship. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So that's another way. John sees what we've been talking about in Isaiah and Hebrews. This is what John sees in the book of Revelation is a, an encouragement for us to persevere, not to give in to the world of flesh and the devil, the mark of the beast, you know, Revelation 13, which has to do with worship. Um, but to, to continue to persevere, to bear testimony to Jesus like John was doing. That's why he was in exile. Um, and, and he sees uh, the church. And he sees the church militant, but also he sees the church triumphant, those who are 
overcomers. We haven't yet overcome, but it's, it's written, the revelation is written to help us to overcome, and one of the great ways of overcoming is seeing the reality of uh, what is happening in the world and what happens each and every Lord's Day uh, when we gather to worship in spirit and truth. So again, John, John 4, spirit and truth, Samaritan woman, and he sees these things now um, in the book of Revelation. Any comments or questions? Churches must keep unchurched people front and center. One good way to check whether your church is ready to reach the unchurch is to see if teenagers love your church services. Not your alternative service, your main open the doors wide service. So how would you answer that? If you go back to the 19th century and a little after that, um, maybe early 20th, this was one of the main reasons for uh, Protestant and Reformed churches bringing in instruments mm-hmm. and, and for all the other entertainment too. So how would you answer this? You've got to keep your own church people and teenagers front and center. John? Right, so we're treating teenagers like they're consumers, and we're teaching them the wrong thing about worship, and, and um, worship is in spirit and truth according to uh, the commandment of God in light of the finished work of Jesus. Anything else that's wrong with this? Again, I'm not, ma- I'm not making this up. I'm taking this uh, from comments that people are, are making in favor of why attending church no longer makes sense. Heidi? Heidi? Yeah, isn't that so obvious? Um, in Revelation 5, was it the teenagers in the unchurched who were front and center? No. And in fact, it's a, it's a warning that those who are outside the gates need to come in, right? And that's how the book of Revelation ends. The spirit and the bride say, come. Um, but front and center of the Lord's Day worship isn't, aren't the unchurched. It's not the non-Christian. It's, it's the triune God. So it's a, it's a complete wrong understanding of, of what worship is and, um, and how we are to, to worship, um, as we just read from Revelation chapter 5. Yeah, I think, yeah, we'll get to the children in just a second and how we do tr- t- train our children um, to, to, uh, to worship in spirit and truth. Yeah, we'll get to that question in just a second and whether or not we should have children's church and remove them from heaven. But that's, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, maybe it's not a bad thing in the end that the era of attending church is dying. And this is another comment. Not sure if this is a Christian comment, but well, it could be actually, I'm not sure. Any uh Right? Yeah, a, a true Christian should want to be uh, with the, the people of God. Um, yes, cultural Christianity is dying out. So those numbers I gave at the beginning, it's probably a reflection of really what was already there. Any other? Um, I, God will always preserve a remnant. That happened in Isaiah's day. Uh, almost everything's cut off. We'll get to an Isaiah 6, but there's a shoot a branch, and that, that would be Jesus himself as well. The gates of Hades will not prevail, and Jesus did warn that false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Sometimes we don't even need great signs and wonders to skip heaven, um, but if that were possible, and uh, it will be in the end times, that, that, will, that will happen. Uh, all most churches want is someone to sit there, shut up, give tithes, and worship the church leadership. Uh, This is their um, spelling and everything. That is all they care about. They don't make people feel included or part of anything bigger. Total waste of time going. (laughs) Yeah. 
There probably, yeah, that's probably, uh, there's probably a lot of truth there. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and as 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 Pastor David said, and you, you know, it's, there probably is an uh, some truth in that. I mean, a lot of churches, you know, you read church growth books and stuff like that. You know, the ABCs of church growth. Every church planter knows the A is attendance, the B is the building, and the C is the cash. Well, that that's what you need for church growth. Um, and it, it does seem like there's nothing, anything bigger. But what, what we're looking at tonight, what could be bigger than going to heaven? What could be bigger than the new covenant? What could be bigger than the shed blood of a Jesus who sits at the right hand of, of God the Father? Now, I, I can't show you these things by sight, right? And I, I think Meg was getting at this. The Spirit must show you these things. So there's no song and dance that I can do to help you see the reality only God the Holy Spirit can do that. The temptation is for the preacher and the worship team to, to do all the entertaining so you think you can see by sight and hear with your ear, uh, you know, heaven itself. There's nothing, I mean, I can preach the word, right, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit. So the, word, the Spirit uses the word, but it, it's not my song and dance. It's, it's, it, it has to be the supernatural work of God. I think John mentioned Ephesians 2. You know, we're dead in our transgressions and sins. We, it must be the Spirit of God who opens our eyes to these things. But there is nothing I can humanly do or nobody, nobody on earth can humanly do. No choir, no instrument, no noth no building or campuses, no cathedral, whatever it is, it must be the sovereign work of God, the Holy Spirit. Salvation is of the Lord. Being able to see these things by faith must only, it can only come through uh, the blessing of the Spirit. It is, it is, everything in Christianity is supernatural, right? From start to finish. And, and that, that's where it's at. It is much bigger, but I can't, you, you must pray and ask that the very things that you're hearing with your head, you need to speak to your heart. I can't speak to your heart. The Holy Spirit is the one who speaks to the heart and convicts. The, the, uh, um, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. I can't do that. Um, it's, it's the Spirit of God alone. He uses weak vessels. He uses, of course, the Word of God, which is living and active, as Megan mentioned, um, but we don't, we don't have any other tools. We, the, we're, what you end up doing is you're manipulating people if you are going outside the supernatural work of the Spirit. And by God's grace, I pray that I would never, ever be manipulating other people. So if you find it boring, uh, I, I, I pray it's, you know, I, I'm boring. I think, yeah, the Apostle Paul seems to have been a little bit boring if, you know, people fell out of windows and died. He could raise them. I couldn't, all right? So I'm going to try to help you out. I'm not going to keep you here till midnight. Um, but it, it has to be the work of the Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's all, everyone's participating. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and you're training your others to participate. Not just children, adults need to be trained um, as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing that as the, the one, the body of Christ. And uh, it is an amazing thing. Like when you sing, God can hear you. 
That's, that's an amazing, and when God speaks that I can hear him, it, it's, it is supernatural. All right, the Bible clearly says that salvation is by grace through faith. Going to church doesn't save us. Hopefully you guys, you guys are getting better at this. How do you answer this, John? This is slide 33. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a hard time um, naming the slides. There are so many tonight. So I had to do something different. Yes, that's right. We are saved to um, this. Um, so we, um, it, this is a half truth, but sometimes half truths like uh, water with half filled with poison is, is still very deadly. Um, one of the purposes of our salvation is to go to heaven, and why would the saved choose to go anywhere else besides heaven on the Lord's day? You know, Psalm 73, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 73. So whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. Right? I hope so. I, I know I struggle with that. That's the flesh. But that, that's the struggle that we are in. Oh, God gave us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that we are saved. He is the living and indwelling proof that we belong to God, have been taken away from Satan, and are being sanctified until we go home. Through the Spirit, we are able to live holy lives in this world. The church doesn't do any of that. Okay. Yeah, it's the, the Holy Spirit's presence uh, in the context of the, uh, the assembly of, of the church. And uh, we continually need to be delivered, right? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So that... <clears throat> Yes, we are saved, but there's a, a perseverance in that. We should also understand that one of Satan's goals is to keep the true church from going home on the Lord's Day and worshiping in spirit and truth. So going home isn't just something that we do at the end of our life when we die and have nothing better to do. Uh, going home is something that we do each and every Lord's Day. Um, yeah, and again, that's uh, what we've been talking about. Um, where we assemble on the Lord's Day is where you will be 100 years from now, 500 years from now, and until Jesus returns and the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. You are, we gather with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And there's a long list of those spirits in Hebrews 11, but it's all of God's people. It's an amazing assembly that we are part of each and every Lord's day. Amazing, uh, the, all the, the angelic host, not the fallen angels, but the angelicals, those are not fallen. Um, they also rejoice in the finished work of Jesus because what happened to Satan affected all of heaven itself as well. So our common confession, and this is part of our membership, to the end that you may grow in the Christian life, do you promise that you will diligently read the Bible, engage in private prayer, keep the Lord's Day, regularly attend the worship services, observe the appointed sacraments, and give to the Lord's work as he shall prosper you. So Rebecca's getting a double dose of this because she just finished up the church membership class and uh, we talked about this on the Lord's Day. Um, should we remove children from the public worship of God and give them something else to do? I think Sue's been bringing up the children aspect of it a lot, but um, should we give them something else? <laughs> right. Um, once you begin thinking rightly about church, why would you take your church, your children, uh, and keep them from coming to heaven with the rest of God's people? Now, I understand a lot of parents been there, done that. Heidi more so than me, because I get, you know, to be up front, and she, it's difficult. There are a lot of challenges to teaching your children to worship, um, but that's that you're teaching them. For one thing, we live by faith and not by sight. Um, but it's very important that we are, are teaching our children from a very young age and including them from the lips of children and infants. Uh, the Lord has ordained strength, right, in Psalm 8. Uh, so uh, we, don't, we don't keep our children. Now, uh, Jonathan Edwards has a long sermon about this, and it was many years ago that I read it. And if, if a person isn't a true believer, they're not actually in heaven. So there, there are a lot of unbelievers that come to church. Um, but... Th 
but it's, it's the work of the, of the Spirit of God. But for the unbeliever, there is that invitation um, as well. So it does, just because you are in church, I want to make clear, it doesn't mean that you are justified. You still need to have a personal faith in Jesus. You still need to put your faith and trust in him. Um, but this is where God's people are assembling, and this is where the Spirit and the Bride are inviting you to come and participate in this in this age um, so that after death, but also when the Lord returns, you will be in his blessed presence forever and ever. Any comments or questions about children? Right, right. Yeah. Yes, um, that, that's right. So uh, we need to be careful not to treat young children as if they're uh, inconvenient distractions from, you know, me and more important things. Um, we're, I mean, we, we still live on the earth. In heaven, there won't be those distractions, right? So we need to wait until uh, our, our spirits are perfected in holiness and we appear before the presence of Jesus. But, uh, but yeah, there will be uh, distractions, but some of those distractions uh, remind us of important things. And when you do hear, and we should pray for many little you know, young children, but it is a reminder that, that God, uh, God uh, has ordained strength and praise through little ones. And we must be like little ones in order to enter the, the kingdom of God. So we, we should... Uh, rejoice. Uh, the Psalms that we sing, Psalm uh, 131, you know, like a weaned child trusting in the Lord. So there's, there's so much to learn from uh, children, uh, like we learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yes, we, we should be very thankful. Uh, a couple last things as we come to the end of our time. Um, and uh, John mentioned this at the beginning. What are some of the dangers and blessings of live streaming church services to a larger audience? What are some of the dangers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so. This is one of the problems, right? Because, you know, I'll, I'll never be a great preacher like John MacArthur or someone, something like that. And, and people might say, well, I can listen to John MacArthur. And, you know, I, I, I can kind of cut the, you know, uh, jump to the top. Um, so that, that is one of the, the dangers. And I, I think, and I, I really think that um, even though some ministers are more gifted in expositing and reaching people than others, uh, they need to make it clear they are no substitute for the local church, and and I, I you know I'll I'm only a servant I won't judge another's you know the servant of another, but um, if who am I to think that I am the pastor of North America and I'm reaching everyone, and that what I am preaching is a good substitute for what you could have. And, and sometimes I'm critical, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give credit where credit is due. Um, our, our neighbor um, is Roman Catholic, and uh, because of COVID, she began attending online, and she found a, a priest, I think, in Long Island, and she just loves this guy's preaching, loves him. Doesn't, I think she stopped going locally across the street, right? She, this guy's so great. And so I think she wrote to him and said that, and he said, you need to stop. You need to go to your local church. And I was like, yep, he's, he's got that right. You really do. Um, and uh, because there's no substitute, you're not going to heaven by staying. You know, here's my, the way we're putting it tonight. You're not going to heaven by staying at home watching some kind of live stream preaching. Listen to sermons. I love listening. So I'm not saying don't do that. But it's no substitute for the, the worship uh, and the, the going to heaven itself. So I think that's one of the great dangers. And I, I do think evangelicals have kind of fallen into uh, that that trap. Uh, when I was uh, ordained and installed, I still remember Kit Swartz's sermon and charged, I think it was a charge to me. He said, stay in your own lane. 
So my own lane is here in Floyd, right? It's not in Long Island. It's not, you know, maybe if it, there's churches underground we can reach, that we uh, something different that I've discussed with others, but uh, there's no, don't, if, if you're a person who's watching online and you have another church you could go to, you know, go to that, that church. That, that this is, it's very, uh, very important. All right. Um, and <laughs> just to, to quick conclude, how much are people willing to spend for space flight or a vacation to a space station? Have you read that in the news lately? How much people are willing to spend and have spent? Any figures? 50 million, yeah, to go to uh, some kind of international space station for a couple of days. Do you realize that the, the work and what Jesus has accomplished and what we might take for granted each and every Lord's Day is greater? I would love to go into space. I would love to do that, right? Don't get me wrong. But what Christ has accomplished is forever, and it's far, far greater. So I, I'm thankful for things like the space station and, you know, SpaceX and, you know, um, Blue Origin and stuff like that. Those are those are great, uh, wonderful, but it, it pales in comparison to what we might take for granted. I hope we don't we we take it for less for granted uh, what Christ has accomplished and um, what we are part of each and every Lord's Day. Are there any other comments or questions before we close in prayer? Heidi. Mm-hmm. Church is a body of many parts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you were by yourself, I don't think you would think it was a perfect church. You wouldn't have conflict? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would, you would still have conflict, I think. <laughs> it's like the story of the guy that was shipwrecked and marooned on the island, and, you know, a couple of years later he is saved, and the captain of the ship is looking at the island, and, and he's saying, uh, what are those three buildings that you built on the, tr- on the island there? And the guy says, well, you know, that one over there is my home. You know, the captain goes, oh, that's, that's great. And, you know, well, what's that second building over there? He goes, uh, oh, that, that's, that's my church. I actually built a, a church. And uh, the captain's like, well, what's the third building for? Oh, that was the church I used to go to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes those, those uh, the, it's within us. They're, they're, we don't even agree with our, ourselves uh, a lot of times. Um, so, yes, the, the church is imperfect, so the, the bride of, but be careful how you speak about the bride of another man and be careful how you speak about the bride of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Um, you have no clue the price that was paid for her sanctification. Um, so and we should love her. And, uh, yes, despite those imperfections, but maybe we can contribute a little bit um, to making the bride of Christ more... Uh, appealing that voice, uh, the bride and the spirit saying, come and inviting those uh, to participate in eternal life. Now, are there any items for prayer, praise, or thanksgiving? Kaylee? Maria? Marina? All right. Anything else? Okay. Travel to Pennsylvania. Also travel tonight with the rain outside. Anything else? Jen? All right. So for Jen and uh, work decisions and taking on more responsibilities? I'm sure some people, like your husband, will have a word for the Lord, from the Lord about that. But <laughs> All right. Uh, John, did you have your hand up? All right, John and job hunting. Anything else? 
Heidi? All right, well, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for another day of life that you have given to us. We thank you for the opportunity to continue to make application of Isaiah's prophecy, the fulfillment of it, and the age in which we now live. And I pray that uh, you would, through your word and spirit, uh, impress these things uh, not only upon our, our minds and our memories, uh, but on our, our hearts, and that they would become a part of us, a part of us, and are loving you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and are loving our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, we do pray for um, Marina, and uh, we pray for her household and her, her family as they the mourn the passing of her, her dad, and we pray for the comfort of the gospel. And we do thank you that at the very heart of the gospel is death and resurrection and the, and the hope of glory. And uh, we pray that in this veil of tears and with, um, as we mourn with those who mourn, uh, we thank you that it is not as the world mourns. And I pray that her family would come to know that if they don't already know it. Pray for those who will be traveling this evening and this coming weekend for Chris and Megan as they go to Pennsylvania. For those who travel to heaven each and every Lord's Day, we do pray that you would uh, guard our coming in and our going out. Um, both body and soul. We pray for Jen and the decisions that she has coming up about work. Give her wisdom about responsibilities and, and boundaries and help her to know what things uh, that she does need to take up and what things that she needs to put down. And pray that you would bless the, the counselors as well and uh, those who encourage her in this. We pray also for John and that you would uh, provide work for him. And as we also think about uh, preparation and provision for Ben and Teva going to South Sudan, and uh, we thank you again as we've been singing in Psalm 81 that you are a God who can, uh, does provide even honey from rocks. And we do pray that you would indeed do that for John, uh, for Ben, and for Teva, and uh, also for the, the rest of our uh, prayer requests and those burdens that we have that are, are only known to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.